Two eight five one, turn right heading one eight zero. One four Papa, turn right two four five. Report localizer established two seven. Hey everyone, welcome to DJ's Aviation. And welcome to the long-awaited return of my past, present, and future series. If you didn't know, the research involved and time to edit these videos is for the most part more than any of my other videos, and in recent times I've actually been struggling to find that time to make them. However, today it is back. For how long, I'm not too sure, but I'll hopefully be getting back into the series shortly, covering the long list of airlines I've been requested to cover in the comment section by you, my awesome viewers. Today though, it's the past, present and future of Qantas, referred to as the Spirit of Australia. If you're new to the channel and haven't seen any prior episodes, there will be a card linked in the top right of your screen directing you to the entire playlist of my past, present and future series. Without further ado, let's get on to the past, present, and future of Qantas. We begin the story almost a century ago, the year of 1920. This is when the Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Service was formed. This is where the name Qantas was derived from. The airline was specifically founded on the 16th of November in 1920, with the service headquartered originally in Winton, Queensland. This wouldn't last long though. In the following year, Qantas moved their headquarters to Longreach, Queensland. Through being founded in 1920, Qantas are actually one of the oldest airlines in the world. They have advanced incredibly over the past century. From flying fragile biplanes, carrying literally only two passengers, to operating the mega Airbus A380, which can carry 450 people, to launching non-stop Perth to London services. By 1922, Two years after Qantas was formed, the airline began passenger flights and mail flights operating within Queensland. The passenger flights, however, were more joy flights. These airmail services were subsidised by the government, which linked railheads in western Queensland, an area not connected very well at the time. As we move through the 1920s, the airline took on its first apprentice and more importantly, began building their own aircraft in Longreach. This was a huge achievement for the airline at the time. The building of the aircraft began in 1926 and was continuous for around two years when in 1928, Qantas had completed several aircraft and therefore made the inaugural flight of the Royal Flying Doctor Service of Australia. This is an incredibly important airline, if you will, of today, reaching out to Australians in need of immediate medical attention. And it more focuses on those who are in remote locations of Australia that may not have local paramedics or doctors on hand. After more progress like the expansion into Brisbane and the airmail flights from Brisbane to Darwin, the company in 1934 actually changed its name to Qantas Empire Airways Limited. That has quite a nice ring to it if you ask me. Quite long, but it's still pretty cool. A year after the company changed their name, they operated their very first overseas flight. The flight originated in Darwin and ended in Singapore. Once again, this flight was carrying airmail, which was eventually bound for the UK. As Qantas note, this was in cooperation with Imperial Airways, later to be known as BOAC. Through 1939 to 1945, a period where the world was impacted by World War II, Qantas Empire Airways Limited were supporting the war effort. Their main job was to evacuate personnel who risked being captured by the advancing Japan forces. Qantas Empire Airways also dropped supplies at treetop level to troops in New Guinea during the war. The airline also made flights that lasted around 30 hours between Perth and now Sri Lanka. Once again, this was to maintain the crucial link between Allied forces. By 1944, as the World War was coming to its end, Qantas adopted the kangaroo symbol, a symbol now recognised across all corners of the globe as being Qantas. Little did they know it would become so iconic when the choice was made in 1944. Due to the World War, a number of services were put on hold. This also occurred with various other airlines as I've touched on in my previous past, present and future episodes. In 1946 though, these services which were postponed or cancelled for the war were actually resumed, like Qantas resumed their boat services to the UK 
and the new expansion of its network with the DC-3s to New Guinea and India and, of course, the Pacific Islands. As we move through the next 20 years, the airline continued to grow, launching Trans-Australian Airlines, or TAA, to serve the domestic market within Australia. You could compare this now to something like Jetstar. As TAA expanded, Qantas used them to take over the Papua New Guinea routes. The 727 then entered with TAA. The sheer speed and comfort of this airliner was a huge success and further launched Australian air travel to the maximum. The growth was outstanding and Qantas was certainly reaping the benefits from this. However, in 1947, Qantas had all their shares bought by the Australian government. In turn, this meant the airline introduced the Constellation aircraft on their London route and then operated their first flight to Japan. The continued growth of Qantas is startling and amazing at the same time. They continue to thrive with network expansion. Next on their list in 1954 is San Francisco in America. The flight would later be operated by their new 707s. These 707s were ordered in 1956 and delivered three years later in 1959. Four years later, they pioneer around the world services with the same aircraft that is used on the London flight, the Super Constellation. It's turning into one of their best purchases yet. As we skip forward a few years, which were mainly filled with the rapid growth of TAA, Qantas have a huge year, that year being 1967. In 1967, the airline known as Qantas Empire Airways Limited is now changed to Qantas Airways Limited, or simply Qantas. In that same year, the airline placed its order for the iconic Boeing 747. These 747s are iconic for many reasons, and you may not necessarily know why. Some of the reasons are as follows. In 1979, after the aircraft was delivered, they established a world record for the most people that ever embarked on a single aircraft. This was when it evacuated some 673 people on a single Boeing 747. This came when Cyclone Tracy devastated Darwin at Christmas in 1974. As we move closer to the present, Qantas began the overhaul of their fleet and removed their last 707 in 1979. In 1989, the airline received their first 767, an aircraft that was only recently retired. However, Qantas Freight do operate the 767 Freighter version, offering aviation enthusiasts the opportunity of still seeing a 767 in partial Qantas colours. This is similar to the constellation referred to now as the Connie, which has made multiple appearances at the Avalon Air Show. I was lucky enough to see it at the 2017 edition. By 1986, Trans Australian Airlines is known as Australian Airlines and becomes an incorporated public company. However, they do run into troubles when their pilots head out on strike. In turn, this led to the government advising everyone that they were considering merging Australian Airlines into Qantas. Now, you'll recall that earlier I mentioned that the Qantas 747 was iconic for many reasons, making the eventual goodbye very hard. In 1989, in an incredible record for commercial jets, Qantas established a world distance record for passenger aircraft when it flew its first Boeing 747 non-stop from London to Sydney. The flight was a whopping 18,001 kilometers and is something that airlines nowadays dream of achieving especially with Project Sunrise, which will come under the future section of this analysis into Qantas. The flight took 20 hours, 9 minutes and 5 seconds. In 1992, after talks of a merger continued to keep popping up, Prime Minister Paul Keating announced at a press conference that the government took it upon themselves to approve the sale of Australian Airlines to Qantas. In turn, this meant Qantas bought the airline for an estimated figure of 400 million Australian. As we hit the 2000s, Qantas launched their new international subsidiary, Australian Airlines, only for them to cease operations four years later in 2006. Two years earlier though, in 2004, Jetstar, the new low-cost domestic carrier, was born. The move to launch Jetstar would change the Australian domestic air travel market completely and in turn result in other carriers starting up their own domestic low-cost carrier purely in order to compete with the rapidly growing Jetstar. With new aircraft constantly joining the fleet, in 2005, Qantas announced a groundbreaking order for 115 Boeing 787s. 
This was made up of 24 firm orders, 20 options, and 50 further purchase rights. The deliveries for these aircraft were constantly pushed back and as we know were finally delivered in 2017. By 2008, the mighty A380 joined the fleet. While the airline had 20 of the A380s on order, only 12 were delivered. As we continue to move to the final parts of their history, Qantas had an established network with flights to Singapore, Auckland, Brisbane, Los Angeles, London Heathrow, Hong Kong, Johannesburg and so many more fantastic destinations. That concludes the immense and extremely interesting history of Qantas. I'm well aware this was a lot to take in, but hopefully through the annotations on your screen throughout, it was a little bit easier to understand. Anyway, let's move now on to the present or current state of Qantas. In its current state, Qantas operate the following aircraft. The A330-200, A330-300, A380-800, 737-800, 747-400, 747-400ER, and the 7879. This is excluding the Qantas Link fleet. The airline recently begun services to London direct from Australia, making it the only non-stop flight connecting Australia with England currently. The airline also has a number of subsidiaries like Jetstar, Qantas Link, Jet Connect, Express Freighters Australia, and Qantas Freight. The airline also recently underwent a livery change to welcome the Boeing 787s to their fleet. The livery change includes a revised kangaroo design, which received quite a lot of criticism because basically the kangaroo had its paws cut off and this was in an attempt to make the livery seem more modern. The airline has two retro roo liveries as well, among other flying art schemes. The retro liveries include the 1970s colour scheme and the 1959 colour scheme. These liveries are in place to acknowledge their past. However, it's the indigenous liveries which have attracted more attention over the years, with the likes of Wanala and Yanani Dreaming. However, right now, it's the Mendor Ridgey Scheme and the Yam Dreaming livery, featured on the 737 and 787 respectively, which are taking the show. What does their future hold? Well, the future is the future, and honestly, I don't know all the nuts and bolts of their future. Some of it I do, and that's what I'll be shedding some light on as best as I can, as well as a little bit of speculation. The airline will definitely be receiving a further 10 Boeing 787s at the time of recording, with the addition of a further 6 being confirmed in early May of 2018. As for other aircraft, well that's still undecided. Potential options include the 797 if it's ever released, the 737 MAX, and this is just for short to medium haul operations. However, one could argue the biggest part of the future for Qantas is Project Sunrise, which is described by CEO Alan Joyce as the final frontier of aviation, and is the idea that an airliner can operate non-stop services with a full payload continuously from Sydney to London, Melbourne to New York, Brisbane to Paris, and so on, all of this occurring before 2022. The two aircraft rumoured to fit this project is the 777X and the A350 ULR. With no orders placed for either, the ball is currently in Qantas' court as we await a firm decision. Rumours have also noted that a potential big order is coming in 2019 for a new long-haul aircraft, but we will have to wait and see if this actually eventuates. Either way, in regards to aircraft, I'd certainly expect more news on potential orders coming out in the near future. Now, in regards to routes, well, the Qantas network is really extensive as it is, but probably not as extensive as Qantas and others would like, and that's actually including myself. Qantas are yet to dip into the Canadian market properly, as well as the US market. While sure, Qantas do operate flights to US cities, I am absolutely certain they'd like to expand further, for example, to Seattle. As for other locations, India is also an area Qantas are yet to launch services nowadays into. With the demand for air travel growing and the quality of Air India dropping, this also is a huge area of potential for them. Personally, Europe is somewhere I would like to see them expand into heavily, with locations like Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Rome and Paris all being places I would like to see Qantas head to. Whether these routes are launched when the airline receives either more 787s or when the aircraft which are involved in their Project Sunrise arrive, I'm honestly unsure, 
But where do I think they will actually begin services to? I honestly feel like the Asian market is the one that is constantly growing. And I feel like Qantas launching up new services to new cities within China, Japan, and so on would be extremely beneficial to their growth. If you take a look at what's happening with Virgin Australia, they recently launched services into Hong Kong and it has completely changed them in the international game. Now, I completely realize this is probably one of my longest analyses videos ever, but I wanted to do this properly and include everything I possibly could. The thing is though, there is actually more. Unfortunately, this video would have been insanely long, maybe even up to the half an hour mark, and I know it's already pretty long, but it probably would have reached the half an hour mark if I included absolutely everything. I personally believe that these are the key points to analyze, and I am aware I probably missed something. As for future episodes in the series, I touched on this earlier in the video. Um, I'm going to be trying my absolute best to continue the series as regularly as I can. But this script alone took me two hours to write, research, and well, at the time of recording, I have no idea how long it's going to take to edit. The raw file is sitting at around 19 minutes. So I guess all I can ask is just for your patience if that's okay. If you made it to the end of the video, I do truly, truly appreciate it. I won't go over all the usual formalities like saying like the video and subscribe, rather I just want to say thank you for watching, I do truly appreciate it.